Um, welcome everybody to Verge Center for the Arts. It's great to see such a crowd today, even given how hot it is. My name is Liz Mo, and I'm the founding director here at Verge Center for the Arts. And I'm so pleased, this is the first year that we've had full audiences um, again for our programs. And so it's really tremendous to see you all here. And also I just wanted to point out that without membership, it wouldn't be possible to do this and to continue to bring this programming to the region. So if anyone here is not a member, please see one of us when you become one so that you can participate in our regional art community. I also want to thank the Portrait Foundation and Bonhoeffer Custom Homes for making the Steve's installation possible. They were our two major founders this time. The show runs through September 17th, and I hope that you keep coming back to see how the room evolves because the coffee table is falling apart, as Mary pointed out earlier. There's one side that you can't quite see because it's covered by the couch, so <laughs> some really good today. <laughs> And then for housekeeping, if you have a cell phone, please make sure that you turn it off. Uh, bathrooms are through the door. When we get to the Q&A, we're going to set up a microphone, and we ask that you ask your questions into the microphone. So if you just raise your hand and come up, or you can even queue up at the end. So that way, we're recording this talk, and everything that you ask, not only will Steve and Richard be able to hear, but it'll also be uh, audible to the recording online. So with that, I'm going to start off by introducing Steve, and then I'll introduce Richard, and we'll turn it over to them. So Stephen Caldwell has been a seminal figure in the Sacramento arts community for the last 52 years. He was a professor in the art department at CSU Sacramento from 1970 to 2005, influencing numerous generations of artists. Additionally, he is known for his many large-scale public art commissions throughout Sacramento, and his much beloved portrait of his father at the Viva de Proper Art Museum since the early 80s. He has had a substantial career outside of Sacramento as well. His work has been the subject of a solo exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art. He was included in several formative exhibitions on conceptual art, including Live in Your Head, When Attitude Becomes Form at the Quince Tall Burn, Information at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Nine at the Viva Castelli at the Castelli Warehouse in New York and many others. More recently, he had a retrospective at Museum Stutzky in Lodz, Poland in 2017, and another career retrospective at the Hemeny Museum in 2020. Faltenbach's work is in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Institute, Art Institute of Chicago, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, the National Gallery of Art, and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Richard Haley, is an artist, curator, and writer who recently moved back to Northern California after spending the last 13 years in Detroit, Michigan. Recently, his photographic work was shown in a solo exhibition at Conduit Gallery in the Bridgewood, Queens. His collaborative writing on art with Dr. Mary Elizabeth Anderson has been featured in the journals Body, Space, and Technology, Adjacent, Performance Matters, and others. Upcoming, he will be co-curating the show Auditions at Emerson Forest Gallery in Miami, Florida, with Felicia Carlisle in 2024. Now I will recommend and welcome Steve and Richard. Yeah, my right here is like that. So yeah, my phone. The other side, it'll be better. Hmm. We're using the microphone. That's important. Um, hello, thanks. Thank you all for coming. Um, so today we're just gonna Steve's gonna talk about some of the work in the show. I assume you've all seen it, uh, hopefully. And if you're here, you know Steve's work. So um, I ask Steve, you want to answer questions after this, or okay, I'm <laughs> you can't understand it's too much. Okay. 
I hate to think that you would have to use the microphone once and then turn to me and ask me the same question. But... Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, so we'll, uh, we're going to just go through the show. Um, so if anybody has questions at the end, I think we'll be open to that. Um, but uh, first, open Steve's open to it. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, I assume you've all seen the show. And uh, the first work we wanted to talk about was the Holes in the Wall by Clyde Dillon, who happens to also share the same body with Steve, if uh, you aren't aware of that. The same, I think it's even the same DNA, same skin, but sometimes the same experiences, pretty much. Same experiences. Um, so I, my question uh, for you, we got to use the mic. They can't hear it all. Okay, so we're going to have echo or nothing. Okay, let's just do the best we can. Okay. So um, I'll ask you, I guess I'm going to hold the mic. Yeah, I'll be holding you. Um, so I was introduced, right? You were introduced. I, I could add more to that. Okay, you uh, should add more to that. Yeah, uh, there are things you should, if you listen to someone talk about uh, whatever, I, I think you should know something uh, a little more detail about who's talking so you can uh, make a better judgment about that. So uh, there are a few things. Um, I, I'm a Christian and uh, I, will, I started out as a Lutheran. Uh, they never uh, mentioned uh, anything about the relationship with God, so it was all history. And I, so I was pretty much done with it at, at 12 years old. And um, uh, so then um, I seeking more uh, spiritual experience uh, led me to, um, ex well, it was uh, 1967. Uh, I was the only person at the art department at UCD who wasn't taking drugs. So of course that didn't last. And, and so I, I got into doing that uh, very enthusiastically. I, I, I actually thought it was a wonderful thing. And um, I'm not actually going to say that I was completely wrong about that, but the level of uh, involvement uh, was too much, apparently, because my experience turned from wonderful to uh, 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 frightening. And uh, it seemed as though uh, instead of just the hallucinations that I was paying money for, uh, I was actually being uh, contacted by uh, dark and really dense entities. And uh, it, it wasn't something that I could live with. And so, uh, I decided, okay, if either, well, it's it's always a question. Um, is this person uh, experiencing something real or generating the, the experience within his own mind? It just seemed like there was too much coordination between uh, what what I was hearing and experiencing and what was happening on the outside to be something that I was generating with my own mind. And so I decided, well, if the, the bad guys are there, then maybe the good guys are there. And so I decided to just uh, come out and ask God if he was real and if he'd be willing to uh, let me know that personally. And I said, please don't send uh, a nice couple to my uh, front porch on Saturday morning and with uh, it's something that I, I already know about it right? because I've had I've studied uh, Bible history in my before I was twelve, and so uh, I expected something to happen over time that I would be able to uh, decide whether or not it was something that I wanted really to commit to, and um, it didn't happen over time. It happened instantly, and it was in English, and oh, God speaks English. And it, it was, uh, we are going to clean up your act. 
And I thought, well, that, that doesn't really sound like a line that, that anyone would write for God, but um, I, I'm going with that. And so I, right there, committed myself to um, trust, trust God. And um, I, I knew that I, I still had my mind. So uh, if uh, somebody else decided to pretend to be God and come whisper to me to do things that were wrong, then I would know that. And so um, that's been my life uh, since I was 38. It's something that you should really know. And um, it's my experience. I'm not going to uh, necessarily, uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to try to prove it to you. Um, I, I think everybody is responsible to uh, gather their own uh, data. In fact, uh, to, to me, uh, my, my former self, before this happened to me, I was a, a science fiction reader and a, a reality of, of, a, of this super powerful being was like science fiction to me. And so I think that, that uh, we're all uh, in our way uh, living toward an experience that will make this make sense. Um, and sometimes I think people who uh, arrive on your doorstep on Saturday morning make it more difficult for us. It, it makes it seem less uh, likely. So, so, so that's me. And um, I uh, am a person who um, I tend to, uh, I, I don't tend to work at my art, I tend to uh, live my life and uh, things to do come to me. And they have a variety of, I'm sorry. They, uh, they have a variety of uh, strength of attraction to me from, wow, I gotta get going on this right now to this is something to do until something else comes along that I'm more interested in. So um, that's how it is. I am not very uh, scholarly or logical about pursuing one thing after another, but that does happen anyway. I think it happens with art. Art is going to, if, if, unless you're uh, doing a job where you, you uh, have to make stuff uh, because that's what you're known to make, and I think art will uh, do its best to uh, move you forward, uh, not necessarily toward better stuff. I think that it just took toward different stuff that um, you are simply what you do suggests the next thing. I, I observe it in most of the artists that I know. And now, um, I, I think you know me well enough. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Richard and let him ask me a question. Okay, I'm not sure how to follow that up. Um, I feel good. Um, but maybe we can just quickly pivot from there. Um, what makes me wonder uh, about aspects of spirituality in your work? Because, I mean, once you know you, I think you can start to easily find it. But it's, um, I, I think there's only one in there, but to me, it is, there's a golden halo above in the storm. And I'm wondering, is, uh, do you, is there a room for spirituality in contemporary art in your work? Is that an important thing for you? And maybe I'm sticking my foot in my mouth to see spirituality and huh. Christianity. Um, I'm hearing you clearly. Okay, you're hearing me clearly. So maybe you'll answer that. Well, like, yeah, um, I would say there is not room for spirituality in uh, contemporary art, not comfortably anyway, but that's all for the better. I mean, uh, putting something in a place where it doesn't belong is a major art um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, <laughs> somebody must know. <laughs> a, a way of working. One of my um, any, anyway, it, it's uh, for me. It, it's one of my protocols. It, it's a, to me, where a work of art is can be as important as what it is. Where, where a work of art is can affect the nature of the work as much as what it is. Also, who sees the work can affect the work, the nature of the work, as much as who has what it is. Well, I, I mean, so, so that gives me an opening that I was expecting. Uh, so has everybody seen the sidewalk clock that's out in front or know Steve's, uh, his work is sidewalk clocks. So before you walk in to the verge on S Street there, there's a plaque cast in bronze with the word skin. And if you've seen uh, uh, over on the UCD campus, there's some other sidewalk plaques. Um, but uh, those pieces are not, uh, those were meant to be anonymous. They're um, shown outside of art galleries and this one's art gallery adjacent, but that wasn't their intent. Um, so can you talk about what your interest in working with anonymity, anonymity is and um, in uh, spaces not generally seen as art spaces, um, such as like your sidewalk plaques or the graffiti works you've done in the class or your ads in the forum. Um, so you were just mentioning that uh, the importance of the location. So I assume working outside of an art context has uh, been an important thing for you since you've been doing that for I guess about 50 years. Well, no, right. Yeah, I don't know. Wow. What about uh, maybe? We can't hear you. Oh, we know. Steve was asking. This would just be going on. Sorry. This was Sorry about it. it. I mean, I don't know, maybe pivot I mean, from that. Somebody, I mean, somebody knows what? who's who's trying with the shrimp now, who, who did the pieces that are. Uh, Mike Henderson. Uh, yeah, Mike Henderson. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I saw his show at the Whitney in New York. I was living in, in New York at the time. And it's uh, very aggressive, violent stuff. Uh, it's about uh, it, things that happen between uh, people of color and police. And uh, it, it wasn't a, a good thing at all. And my did that his show, I think it's still open. No, okay, never mind. But uh, too bad if you didn't see that. And so, but when I saw that show, I was thinking, this is really powerful. But uh, what would it have been like to be where it was really happening? Because this had played out. And so um, I, I was thinking that possibly, hello, I see. I, I was, so I was thinking that, that the um, fact that you're in a gallery, you, you know it's art, in a way, it puts it's a one step away from the poetic uh, resonance and content. Of the work, and um, so the the this suggested the, the possibility of. Uh, I'm not saying I invented it or anything. Uh, it's, it's like if you look at art history, nobody has invented anything. Uh, maybe with the exception of Duchamp, but uh, everything has been done. So, uh, what was the question? <laughs> uh, I was uh, just wondering where your interest in working outside of art spaces came from and in these anonymous like, works. And you mentioned that this, the, the institution, the institutional framing, can numb the work down. I wonder if you still feel that way. 
Uh, yeah, and also the uh, knowing who did it, and it becomes uh, a Donald Judd. And so you're looking at an object, and you're also looking at a reputation. That, that's it. And um, let's keep talking about the sidewalk plaque a little bit more. Um, so, uh, so the, the plaques, you were usually, like we were talking about the show you saw that, um, I mean, you're talking about a reputation and the, the author in the institution makes it art, but, and then you're working outside of there. And then these pieces you're, that you made, the plaques, they're not images, they're not, they are objects, but not necessarily, they're not trying to be object they're texts. So I'm wondering how you, how did you get to learn to work with just like singular words or sometimes there's two words in a public context? Okay, so the question is, these are, if you didn't see the bronze plaque, it's simply the word skin, S-K-I-N, and it's cast in bronze and it looks, it's neatly made, so it looks kind of official. And when I was living in New York City, there were words already in the sidewalk there. Uh, urban nature is what I refer to, and that's just things you expect to see. They're not surprising. The, the word uh, water and the word fire were both existing in, in the sidewalks in the city. And so it took me to do uh, earth, air, fire, and water. And I was interested in the fact that probably anybody, even an art uh, um, expert, uh, people, person used to artists, what they do, uh, could see one of those and not consider it to be something that, that uh, deserved or was appropriate for. The kind of consideration that we have our people, our people who look at our thing, think about art, they can just see that the thing, art of nature. And but then if, if you get to air, it's a little like, what's that? And if you get to the word earth, then it's waiting. There's, there's no explanation for that, really. Uh, so that suggested a, a further. Uh, Group, grouping of four pieces uh, that also paint like earth, air, heart, water, blood, flesh, skin, and bone. And I felt those would stand out to the point where nobody could, uh, and I was wrong about that, of course, but people would generally not step over that without noticing it, but at least much more likely. And and so um, you are also known for your art formats, your micro manifestos. And those again were just uh, texts, and they're uh, I think there's what is it? Is font? I can't remember what, what font it is, but it looks like a which one font. Whatever I thought. Okay, and so I'm wondering again how uh, why why text? You're you're a baker. You're trained. You're trained ceramicist. But um, we went in these magazines that were anonymous, and, and people found out who they were. But this was specifically for an art audience, but they were most uh, aesthetically reduced. And again, you're working with uh, one word or two, three words. Um, so I don't know if you can talk about, again, are you thinking about poetry? Are you thinking about the, the visual impact of the words? Or, uh, and so I think it's interesting that you're a trained maker, but you're, you're pivoting away from options. So as I was a student at Davis in my graduate school, I was reducing the number of elements in my work, making them sit more and more simple. But I wanted to, there was, there was a, a school of art called Minimalist. And uh, I, I was looking for ways to uh, extend that uh, to uh, how, how much could I take away from something and still have to be something. And so um, what I was, that, that's what I was experimenting, experimenting with. 
And uh, so it occurred to me that it would be possible to, without, uh, there's an art magazine called Art Forum, F O R U M, and uh, it has uh, a variety of articles, three or four or five articles about art, about specific artists, and then the rest of it is advertising. And when I was doing this in the late uh, 60s, uh, there, there were maybe 10 or 15 pages in the front and the back. Now, uh, there's basically an encyclopedia of ads, so you would never find my anyway. But, but so I decided, okay, well, uh, if I was having a show, I could publish, ask the gallery to publish uh, an announcement in our forum. But if I'm not having a show, I could still publish something in our forum. And then that would be the thing. So it was kind of a funny thing. I called the uh, ad director of our forum and asked him to publish the word art works. ART, W-O-R-K-S, uh, below. Uh, no no uh, period at the end of the sentence. Everything in caps. And uh, so the guy took that down. And then so then he said, well, what, what's the thing of doubt I heard? And I said, there's nothing else. That's all I'm publishing. That's all I want to do to print for me. And so he said that, what? Well, well, what good will that do? This is going to cost you money, and nobody will know what it's about. And, and I didn't know enough yet to, to say they'll know. But I didn't know that. And I was so surprised when the magazine came out, and within three days, there was somebody in Europe calling, Who did that? <laughs> what is that about? And it was a complete surprise to me that it, it would be uh, uh, so quickly, but um, it had uh, a, a character, this characteristic of uh, less information being more effective in a certain way. Uh, is that it? Yeah, I guess. Okay, uh, Richard understands, so I guess that was clear there. <laughs> and so, sorry, that was a bit soft. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, uh, could be. <laughs> I guess so. I thought it was a different person. <laughs> and so these were not signed and they're anonymous. And is the anonymity the same as, were you thinking the same thing as with the sidewalk box that an author would? If, they, if it was clear that these were Steve's work, would it uh, compress the work and not give it the opening that you look for? I I really didn't know what would happen. And um, to me, part of um, making art, um, basically turning an idea into uh, a vis giving a, a visual expression of some kind. So it can be a physical thing, can be uh, performance that can be auditory. Some it contain meaning of some kind, but there's no rules about, well, I mean, there's the limits, actually, but no rules about what it can be. And I'm very interested in making, making it happen and seeing what it does. I, I really. I think, I mean, I, I wasn't uh, really heavily into art history, and it was probably to my detriment that I wasn't because I, I, I did have some art historical experience that affected what I was doing a lot, but uh, I, I didn't uh, pay a lot of attention, and uh, I think I maybe could have moved places sooner and maybe more effectively. I'm not, not really sure about that, but uh, I didn't do that. 
And let's pivot to the Clyde Dillon works that we're talking about anonymity and things that aren't, um, that don't have your name on them. So uh, if you were to go out in the gallery and make elliptic carry, um, then you'd see there's these two pieces that are, I guess, holes, one above a door, and then one which looks kind of like a, a cat's bronze hole that's kind of sticking out from the wall. And uh, Steve, at some point, you, you'll tell us, uh, invented, maybe calls it an alter ego, or uh, he gave this body to work. He says it's authored by Clyde Dillon, which um, I think is Steve as well. And so I'm wondering if you could uh, talk about why you, I mean, to begin, why did you decide to sculpt uh, another identity? Why did you, why was that necessary? Or why did you think it was necessary? Or why did you want to experiment with working under another game? So I think one of, one of the things that commonly doesn't come easily is to uh, move away from the, the work I'm familiar with. I, maybe that's really too obvious, but uh, on the other hand, I think it's a, a big factor in our that we tend to rework from what we know both uh, our the work that we in some way generate from just the our, our mental ideas of life and from the work that's happening around uh, around us. It's uh, I it, it happens even if you don't know who it's coming from. I, I was a person who, uh, when I was in grad school, um, a good friend of mine, Edward uh, Higgins, said, you've got to read about Duchamp. And uh, I said, well, I'm not reading about anybody right now. He said, um, well, you're, you're being influenced by him. So it would make sense that you would know that and kind of specific about it. And so um, that, that's what I've been my position. And, that, uh, and I think it, it's uh, an artist, that's where we are. Um, we are building on uh, what's gone before. Um, and we change it. And, uh, and I think it, we're looking for a way to uh, qualify our uh, good as good or what I, what I recognize as uh, art as an ability to affect me in a personal way, either conceptual uh, or emotional. So this tends to be, it certainly can be traced back to. Um, the artists who like to be able to make it up. And, but uh, also uh, in, in coming, being filtered through your own personality, it gains a uh, personal presence that is like what um, I think artists have to have your, it's, your, it's our job to express that. I mean, I see the similarity as poetry. So, creating a, an alter ego or another version of yourself and creating a whole other body of work seems kind of like an extreme version of a way to get outside of yourself to make to make a body of work. Thanks for repeating the question. <laughs> Forgot to answer it. Uh, well, it seemed like. Uh, it seemed like, I guess I can say it, it seemed like a fun idea. It, I mean, um, I wasn't sure how, I, I actually had no idea how effective it would be, 
but it seemed as though uh, it possibly would uh, create effects some, as coming from some direction. And I'm not, it wasn't really true, well, but I was thinking, well, um, remember we were talking about that when you're seeing the piece, you're seeing also the artist and and who she, she is at the, at the same time. And so I thought uh, one, one possibility of anonymity, another possibility would be to try to put myself in someone else's place in a sense. And so the first, um, what, what I referred to as, uh, hang on a second. I referred to them. Uh, I'm sorry about this. I'm 83. Now, part of Richard's job was to tell me what I'm talking about. I am uh, what, what I've referred to them as an, it's not that important or anything, but as life dramas. I was thinking of kind of an anonymous. Uh, performance and uh, something that could be carried out uh, in a, a number of different ways. What I thought the first thing, uh, okay, I, I have another process. You might have to get me back and track. Okay. But because I, uh, what, what was happening was that. I forget what was about. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just let the lecture ball kind of distracted. I want to know why that person. <laughs> so, so, um, so we're talking about pride and. And uh, oh, oh, in March, okay, I'm sorry, there's so many back. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I, I see the kind of the end of my lecture phase of my job uh, coming, coming someplace there in the future, getting closer. Um, so, yeah, well, what so I was thinking about. I, I decided I needed a, a protocol, uh, another protocol, and I decided to call it the protocol of opposites. And what I would do is go to a bar with uh, my friends and um, talk about art and so on. And it seemed like a recurring theme was good painting and why people thought of painting was good and what made it good. And so I was thinking, well, what about if you went the other way? What makes that painting? And I, I, I seriously considered it for a while, and I, I came up with the fact that it would have to be created by artists who didn't understand the, what contemporary art, what, what the, the job is of contemporary art, what, what it needs to do, or what how it needs to uh, interface with viewers. And, so uh, it could be uh, uh, another way to approach creating city painting would be um, uh, with that and uh, decorative sense. And then I thought, well, well, two things happened. One thing, I was uh, working on pieces that were uh, three by four inches. And I was renting a lot in New York City that was 100 feet long, 25 feet wide, and 13 feet high. So I had some extra space. And uh, when my friends would come from Davis, they, they graduated from to New York while they were looking for a space. I just had all of this space. And so they could just move in for a while and then they would find a place to leave and so on. And so one of them got a job with Lord and Taylor's department store. And Lord and Taylor's has is an upscale department store. It has a gallery uh, attached in their furniture section. 
and the gallery has concrete paintings. So they sell paintings to go over couches, they sell. And I thought that's it, that's perfect. And so I uh, interviewed the guy uh, living at the other end of my at the other end of my walk, and just he said uh, they they have a curator. You can you can uh, I can get you an appointment. And so I, I went and talked to her, and she invited me to bring my work in. And so I, I didn't have any work in, but I thought I could just I could take a month or two or whatever, and I could make couch paintings. And so it was a lot harder than I expected. And uh, my success, if, if you uh, judge it by my success with my interview with the curator of the college painting gallery, uh, it wasn't that great because I, I painted 10 paintings and I took them in. And uh, she was very nice. And we set them out around the room like I imagine happens. Um, and um, Talked about it, and she said, finally, if she gave me a half hour, and she finally said, you know, I don't think you're ready yet. <laughs> and and so, uh, I, I, I'm here, and she said, come back in a year. And so uh, I left them on the way back. Uh, I was just thinking, I can't do this for a year. I can't do, I can't do that. And so and that was the end of that phase of, of the, the talk. And um, if we, excuse me a second. Huh? I think so. Oh, well, anyway, okay, now I remember. <laughs> so um, I was. Um, um, Thinking that I didn't have to stop here, I might be able to do something else. And so I, I thought, what about a sculpture? Sculpture. And uh, I was thinking about there's a whole series of uh, galleries in New York, professional galleries that sell work. Uh, I think some of them are as successful as um, the gallery that handles contemporary art that's, that's considered important. And so um, I, I thought maybe I could do something like that. And so I looked at those galleries and, and saw that they tended to be uh, uh, graceful or um, uh, high quality, easily uh, uh, could be seen as beautiful uh, surfaces like. Polished marble and uh, highly polished metal, gold, gold plate, silver plate, things like that, stone, and different kinds. So, so um, I decided to be a uh, a sculptor, and I, I made myself for no good reason, Clive Dillon. And so um, I worked in that. I, um, one of the things I did was I would leave New York City in the summertime. It was pretty uncomfortable. I still had friends here at Davis. Uh, uh, yeah, next door at Davis. And so uh, I knew the secretary of the art department. We were good friends. She would get me a couple of classes. I guess so far myself here. My job in New York, I was also teaching at an uh, art school in New York to just support myself. So I would come back here and I did the bronze castings and have the stone made, everything. And by the time I got back to New York, I really, it was, I think I mentioned that um, we, we have inspirations or ideas that. Uh, they have a, a level of quality that is sometimes quite a bit higher than other times. I decided this was kind of a low quality inspiration. I wasn't sure I wanted to uh, give my life to it for the next year. And uh, so I went on with, uh, with conceptual work. A lot of times, 
looks like an idea. Uh, for instance, the first ad I put in our forum, I got the idea. I went to the phone. I called our forum and asked for the advertising um, guy. I gave it to him over the phone. He asked me what font I told him, and he told me how much. And it was, um, it's either $40 or 40 minutes from the idea to the completion of the project. So uh, sometimes conceptualists have a lot of time on their hands because it doesn't take that long to make stuff. And so uh, I was uh, continuing to do work in a variety of different ways uh, that all sort of supported each other, suggested other things and so on. And so uh, I don't know if I should go on with it. <laughs> um, the regional artists and uh, I'll read that to you. <laughs> uh, but so why we have we have talked about the couch painting and there is one of the Lord Taylor paintings in the show. So if you go on the show, you see there's a small painting. It does not look like the painting Steve is known for. Um, so it's there, and I think what's always been of interest to me, and I don't think I've, uh, I'm not sure if you've answered it for last year, is the, the work, the, the Lord and Taylor paintings, or the, the story that there is a whole body of work by, by Dylan, that um, when you're talking about conceptual art, that's often the artist of your generation often document these things through photographs or text, but you have chosen for these to be, um, all, the information can be transferred to oral histories, so like events like this where you give a lecture or you probably told Ted the story on your um, uh, Lord and Taylor paintings. So the, sto the story ebbs and flows and changes over the past 50 years. And I'm wondering, and I, and I was wondering why they were so interested in sculpting of oral histories, like I guess if they're contemporary, but there's a photograph and there's a date and there's text, but you have not given us some parameters. So if I repeat the story, it's going to change. Maybe it might change as you tell the story, as you as you change the person to the story might change, but it might change. So, uh, what's your interest in sculpting through that? So, um, the person who decided to call Ted um, is an expert. <laughs> that's because that's a thing. Is an expert. And as much as I, I, well, you don't always know, but it seems that he's, he's really uh, deeply uh, experienced and educated in uh, our, our history. And uh, he, he seems to have a pretty good grasp on what's, what's actual and what's you know, evolved over time just by telling and retelling and uh, uh, not always being exactly um, truthful or um, completely truthful. I mean, sometimes uh, there's uh, room for some creative fiction that uh, I think can make that make things more interesting, as especially as it goes down through history and. Uh, uh, Art historians love to uh, enter into controversy about artists and what they did and what they thought, and why they did it, and all those things. And um, I, I realized that, that uh, it's possible to uh, direct art actually towards someone by what, what the nature of it is. And art historians. Are the best viewers. They, uh, I mean, uh, compared to, I, I, I don't know, I should admit this, but I rate art viewers kind of by how fast they go through the gallery, whether they're talking to each other. Uh, and the reason I do this is because one of my students in New York uh, was, was getting signed up. Uh, to follow people through a museum. Not my whole class was given the assignment to follow people through uh, a museum or gallery. 
and eavesdrop and pretend not to be, uh, don't get too close to them, don't be obvious, but find out what they're seeing and what, they, what, what their attention is. Really. And um, so this one sister came back and she uh, turned in a drawing of these people walking through the uh, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and um, they were wearing blindfolds. And she said they were there for a couple of hours, and they barely looked at any child of chat. And so I was, I was thinking that it really was inspiring for me, which is something, by the way, a, a good reason to teach art because you can't do it without learning about art uh, in ways that never would have I, I, mean, I, I don't see that happening without the evolution of that um, that person's that, that woman's uh, response to that assignment. That was, uh, um, it given me a lot of things to do that was a uh, realization that um, I could I could uh, focus things, or the nature of things could address directly to uh, art professionals, the art, art science, and so on. And uh, I, my uh, name for it was uh, target, targeting, but, but that's a kind of aggressive. Yes. So I'm, I'm looking for another term. Do you want to talk about the big piece or what? Uh, what that does, or do you want to talk about your own councils? The how much time would be chit chatting for five minutes? Okay, we'll talk about the law. Uh, so, uh, the, the show that is named after the large piece in the room where it has been. Uh, not artificially raining in first uh, And so I think uh, one, let's see, what kind of questions should we ask you? Uh, hmm. Okay. Uh, and I, don't, I don't think I want to see the idea. I, don't, I guess one, so, sorry, I mean, now I'm not like to go in and his body. I'm sitting too close. I am sitting very close. It is complete. Um, Okay, uh, so well, since I've known you, uh, you've always been a builder. So like you're known for the large head on Wilson 65th. Uh, me and Deborah have a signature in the back. We have watched you build that with your own hands in uh, New York Sculpture Lab. I think you made that in the next summer of 2003. And Mary was there when you were building the tent and your son. Uh, and so what that does was you act you acted more like a project manager, and as well as the piece that's going up at John Nassau's right now, the inverted, what's it called? Inverted, it's an inverted pyramid. So you're acting as more of a project manager. So I'm just curious if there's a difference in how you see the works, if there's a difference for you in making the works, uh, maybe there's someone who sculpt it with your own hand or use it. Yeah. I, well, I think that because I see artists who are so much more um, gifted in terms of uh, their handwork, their drawing, are artists who only uh, are have have more talent than. than they're really put into use because I remember right now this uh, my brother in law introduced me to a friend of his in Berkeley who was an amazing figure sculptor. And I watched these things just uh, full of life, full of action, full of, uh, I mean, it's, it just seemed as though. Uh, it would be great if he had more contact with uh, maybe contemporary art, but 
Uh, what's that? Me wanting someone else to be more like me? Maybe I don't. I don't really know. Uh, I I could just go on to what that does. Yes, please. Yeah. I'm, so, uh, unless anybody objects. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't joke about things like that. It's a matter of thing. Um, okay, everything, virtually everything in that room is uh, primarily directed at myself. Um, it's about how absolutely precious the moments are that we forget to be here and and do stuff and, and and learn stuff and enjoy our life and we uh, form relationships and um, so um, sometimes times I talk about tough things like oh, you know I'm gonna die I 83 that's gonna happen and um, I mean, I've been wrong before. <laughs> but no, I mean, there's some things I can feel truly uh, unsure about. And, and um, sometimes when I uh, rather continue sitting than going to my studio, uh, I feel like I need something like the video uh, digital piece that is counting down the number of seconds left of my life if I live to be as old as my mother did. And uh, unfortunately, somebody back there, I think, came back to me. I'm kidding, I don't know that one. Uh, calculated when it's going to run out. So it's probably good for a little bit though. You know, I need to get going. You know, I it's it's so nice to sit down. Now I noticed part of the, one big thing about being eighty three is the enjoyment of sitting down. <laughs> so, so I I need those things. So uh, I could walk around the show and um, explain how almost everything in the show is a message to myself. About uh, 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 redeeming the, the uh, time I'm going to get it. And um, these, these messages, I, I don't get a message. And uh, uh, I mean, I've been talking too about the fact that I feel God helps me and is able to communicate with me in a different way. But I'm not talking about that. I, I get ideas to make where I, I make this stuff. Then I see, oh, that's what it, that's what it means. It's me looking at my own work and coming to some realization of what the piece is about. I hope that um, it has enough energy to to that, do that for you too. And I certainly hope that it's um, your message. No, I'm not hearing what they do. You don't need it. You don't need my message. <laughs> you need yours. Am I done? <laughs> it's, it's been an hour. Or have it. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I Unless it's okay. walking here. Oh, okay. Steve's wearing off on me. Um, okay, so we're going to have some questions. A, thank um, you so much for your patience. And if folks want to come up here and ask a question themselves, or as long as they're seated, if you want to say where you are. Um, but we want to make sure that we can hear it on the recording. And I actually want to start with one really quick one that I thought of when we were talking about the SP games. And I'm curious how the public artworks regionally factored into the regional artist piece of your practice. 
And if that has some relationship to the idea that you become a thing, an artist making a certain type of work for a certain purpose, because some of the regional public works that I love them are not necessarily super conceptual or difficult. Oh, uh, she would want to know what is the same strategy you created for SK, the same that you created for your to be a regional artist Thank and those related. Um, so uh, I, I I didn't ever get to that and I would be as efficient as possible. Uh, as I was thinking about life drama pieces where I wanted to assume somebody else, I decided to try to become myself. And the the thing would be that I would leave New York, uh, I would continue secretly doing international uh, contemporary work. Uh, and I guess then it happened. I mean, there were other shows that happened and I wasn't trying to avoid it, but it came to Sacramento. I decided that what I wanted to do was to see if I could work as a regional artist and, and to do painting and sculpture and succeed to the point where I could see if, I mean, just, just see if I could actually Build a reputation like I would like I would um, make it a, a piece of artwork, and um, so I, I thought, well, I could if I had was able to have a show and a gallery or a museum or something that would take care of the painting side, and then if I was able to do uh, the same with sculpture or um, public sculpture, then that would take care of that. So. Um, that that piece is pretty much complete. Uh, I feel like I have a few public sculptures and have some pieces in you know, the local museum. So. And just to clarify, was it for you? Was that a protocol like SK? That, that, well, it became more complicated then because I, I mean, it was really me. I, I was here, uh, married, living my life. Um, doing my, working for a living um, and doing these things that satisfied that protocol, but um, uh, it was not, it was, I, I couldn't I really, I didn't see it as a life drum. I didn't see it as something I was acting out. It was just, it was, it was easier in a way because it was just me and me. Wait, maybe uh, we could also tell people if, if, if this has been going on long enough, I would consider the problem that you needed to leave your second. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not my job. Um, <laughs> anyway. And I'm also Referencing the thing you just talked about too, he made the art form ritual that includes Sarah Bayer's um, essay about speech regionalism available for free. So I would subscribe to that way. Uh, thank you for coming today to talk to us. Um, I'm going to help myself. I have a hard time appreciating both art. Uh, I can stay in front of a piece for a long time and not really feel anything. Uh, and I can stay in next to someone else who uses the same exact piece and has a very strong reaction. Uh, so I'm just wondering, like, for someone who wants to appreciate it more, like, do you have any advice for a person? Um, it seems to me that um, you have everything you need. Uh, you have interest, intellect, and so on. And so maybe it would be a matter of uh, who knows how, how much freedom life has given you, but uh, if, if you try different kinds of art, um, be, see it when you can. If, you, if, if the interest is there, uh, I mean, um, I, I have the same problem. And so sometimes uh, I have the same problem in my own studios. Like, I shouldn't say this, but I mean, sometimes what I'm doing just 
does it do it for me completely. I do it as I do it my best. That, that's so that's my responsibility, but then the level of success. So I think it's a lot like life. You know, sometimes it's it's really worth it for you. Sometimes it's kind of like music, uh, you know. I mean, you know when you're at a concert with a band or artist who is just perfect for you, it's a great experience. I, I guess I'm saying I don't know. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you said it. I think uh, different stages of life uh, bring out different emotions and different art brings out different emotions and people who I think just continue to uh, experiment with different forms uh, brings out the new and different things each and every one of So I do, I really appreciate your ability and uh, your ability to um, yeah, be real and not uh, apologize for who you are. Um, and I think uh, it's quality that's pretty rare and Thank you for just with Thank you. You're welcome. I just have to say one last thing. No, I promise I'll stop. Um, if you're an artist, it's easy to, to be yourself. I mean, it's part of the job. And um, also, people don't expect you to. You know, be a, a run a bank or something. So, you know, the, the, there's a certain level of freedom. Um, so think, um, I've always been intrigued by the Clyde Dillon name. And I'm wondering, um, you don't do things usually very arbitrarily. And so that's such a specific name. I'm wondering. Could it be possibly a combination of the Clyde from Bonnie and Clyde and then Dylan as in John Dillinger, all were outlaws? I'm just wondering, is there something to that or, or no? <laughs> and don't tell a lot. Yeah, I'll tell the truth. You're absolutely right. If there's something for that to you, then there's something for that. <laughs> Um, but, you know, your question brought back a memory. Someone, when I was coming up with that piece, uh, gave me a book of names, like it, so if you had a child. And I, w I went through it, and those, those were two of the more unusual names in the book, and they just appealed to me. I, I apologize here because of, because of the Actuality of it is not very interesting. <laughs> it, I mean, but then, if you'd rather not believe me, <laughs> feel free. Well, uh, I'm really uh, most fascinated by a lot of things we can be set in the film feature. And, um, some of the existential perspective that you have with the material world and the minimalism. I, I, I was curious about the spirituality, like what what do you believe our world is as a, as a material expert of it? Really hard. Thank you. I, I'm the I, I'm quite the Okay, and okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to ask Richard. Richard will interpret for me. Okay, I can I can actually hear it. Well, the echoing really makes it. So that is really good. That was worse. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Uh, let's see if Richard can. Can you can you, say, you think you can tell me? What um, I think I could, but yeah, correct yeah. me, Louis. Uh, Louis was wondering. Uh, wait, now I'm, you were asking about the. How do you see the world we live in um, based on your spirituality, based on your faith? Is that correct? Oh, just from the spiritual perspective, that was what do you believe our world is? Uh, Louis wants to know what do you believe our world is from a spiritual perspective? So the here and now. Yeah, absolutely amazing. It's, 
so much more amazing than what we normally think is going on. Um, somebody here knows the man who made a synchronicity a kind of a buzzword, cultural buzzword. Who is that? Yes, exactly. Correct. So, I don't think somebody in here has the mother that's young. And so I first read that when I wasn't, I was seeing occasionally uh, synchronicity, which is like uh, events lining up in ways that are so perfect that um, the elements are so astronomically against this being chance that it seems like something is guiding events. It's just I that's a theory of that explore. And um, I so so I I guess I would have to say that I have a kind of a interest in ability or practice practice in uh, seeing that in, in life and advancing and so on. Uh, and a lot of a number of different ways. But um, once I, I you may, may remember at the beginning of my talk, I, I gave a 10 minute dissertation on faith. Um, you remember that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. <laughs> So I would say luckily I didn't go on to, but I don't believe in luck. <laughs> so it doesn't seem like it's, it's real. But what seems real is that there's a uh, synchronicity, I think is a good way to put it. He, he was right that uh, doesn't. It's not explained by um, probabilities. It's simply not. And I I think that um, in, in my case, it was it was one big thing that I couldn't explain every five or ten years. And then I had the experience where I committed myself to uh, an unseen. Super being in there, or whatever you're comfortable with hearing. And then it became an everyday occurrence. So, by, by its very nature and, and the fact that it's so expectable that I, I live by that, I, I fully expect God to. Um, Carefully, I just saw a scripture the other day. Um, uh, either cares for the Lord or he cares for you, and that's a misquote, by the way. I can guarantee you, I mean, very misquote. Louis, did Steve answer? Yeah, I think that's the big thing, though. The fact that this is this is inexplicable. I love this inexplicable life. It's just the fact that it's inexplicable. You know, I I ask God for uh, for things and it's so delightful when he says no. <laughs> because it's clear. It's very clear. It's a no. Okay. 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 So I am curious whether the characters under my film has taught you anything about yourself and if there is a relationship between committing to pretending something and uh, cultivating opportunity. Well, uh, it was clear that it was. Uh, she wanted to know if 
you learned anything from the uh, characters? And uh, is there uh, was it is there a difference between authenticity and creating a fiction? Was that? If there's a connection. Oh, is there a connection between authenticity and the, and creating a, a fiction, which I think you believe in? I, oops. Um, I, before I ask for clarification, I had a good answer for you. I, I, Pratt, I really, um, well, you could talk about the, the studio practice of five that you let five to work it better. Good. But that's probably not the yeah, that's, a good, no, that's, that's great. So I I think that possibly I mean life teaches you about yourself, right? Well, I should say life teaches me about myself. I know that for a kind of place for instance. And I think when and on a pretending uh, as an artist, as an art uh, approach, that it can uh, be a little more effective. Maybe, maybe it uh, hikes that effectiveness a little bit, but um, oh, I got it back and now it went away again. Uh, uh, reminds me so much of my dad. Uh, I, my whole family loses their mind about 75, 80, something like that. So uh, when, when it's good, it's really great. And so don't worry about stuff. Thank you. Oh, uh, I think I'm, answer, I'm not really answering for Steve, but one thing that you told me was really interesting is the Clyde Dillon character that at one point he decided that he's going to let Clyde Dillon's work um, become better. He's going to actually, it's not going to be about surface level and not be about what is good or bad art, but actually, I don't know how he did this. He was, You're right on. Okay. So remind me if I forget it. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I did decide it was unfair to apply to do, do this uh, work that's just totally uninteresting to me, and to the point where I couldn't even do it anymore. I couldn't even. I I finished a couple pieces, but the idea of, of uh, pursuing a to a body of work that could be shown was just became impossible for me. Oh, then you decided. To, how did you give Clyde like an actual oh, studio okay. practice? So, so thanks to uh, my gallus, uh, David and Kathy Stone, I was I given a show for Clyde Dillon, and I decided that it was really something that I should uh, give more attention to. So. Treating myself as a real person uh, with the name of Clyde Dillon. I developed a uh, body of work in a logical way. It was a really great exercise for artists, I think, to uh, artificially evolve your own work. And to uh, so I decided to do it to do it by the decade. So I gave Clyde work in the 90s. Maybe the 80s, 90s, uh, the uh, 2000s. There were about five five steps anyway. Maybe I started earlier, 70s. Yeah, 70s. Did I have it in the 60s? I'm sorry, I don't remember. But anyway, the point is that I, oh, uh, <laughs> the view from up here is really education. Uh, <laughs> so the uh, uh, fact is that it was a, a very fun project uh, generated by old friends who have uh, given me uh, their intelligence and, and expertise and interest for years. Ma major aspect of an artist's uh, ability to achieve or make stuff, or, I mean, achieve, depending on what you think of what happens, but still, you know, to be busy doing what, I, what my job was, 
uh, actually generated the fact that the show caused those uh, four or five evolutionary steps that happened with why no one's work wouldn't have otherwise. Was was a whole lot of fun, and I I want to thank David and Kathy who are here and embarrass them. There they are, right in the front row. <laughs> so, yeah, um, that uh, real, not real thing. Um, I was at a Zen Buddhist uh, for 10 years, uh, sitting about down 40 minutes, morning and night, for uh, about a decade. And um, they give you a certain method. So you have a mantra to follow or you repeat a word or count back from one to ten from ten to one uh, backwards and then start over again. You don't try to do it well. Um, you want to avoid trying anything. You're just doing it for disconnected with any um, attempts to avoid it and avoiding attempts. So one day I was uh, involved in it and I decided that if, if I was just pretending to meditate, it would be exactly the same thing as meditating. <laughs> and it sort of blew my mind because so I, I'm pretending to do something, but it's real. It's a, it's a thing. And, and so, I mean, I, 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 and then I wondered if I'd had that clarity uh, 20 years before, what would it might have led to stuff? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Tying into that last thread, famous projection about conceptualism versus realism. Are the time capsules empty? <laughs> well, will you, could you give me your word to believe me? If I answer it? I'll believe whatever you say. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Completely fair. Okay, the answer is maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Although there's a sometimes an unexplained rat. <laughs> I think it's an absolutely burning question I have to ask. We're going to wrap it up. Steve, you'll be here. You can get folks. Uh, I just, I just wanted to say one last thing. I think it's a okay. Oh, okay. Um, so, some of them can be uh, unscrewed and come up, come apart so you can actually look and see what's there. Uh, there are other ways. To access them, I've made almost a hundred of them, and you got to do something different. You know, it's just like it's about that's a whole thing about how to, how to treat uh, concealment and uh, you know, yeah. great. I can't think of the word, so that's it. I promise I'm not going to say anything. About it. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so yeah, so we hope you'll stick around. The gallery is open. Um, Steve will be here and Richard will be here to answer questions about the curation and the Berlin show. And then also keep an eye on our calendar, our website, if not on our mailing list, because we have some more really cool programs coming up. Um, I actually forgot to put it in. Uh, so we will have a lot of good him. He's written a book and he'll be here to um, read his book. About it's just kind of hard, not sober. So that's just off the top of the head. But lots of really cool stuff in advance. So make sure you stay in touch with us. And thank you so much. And coming out to sit here and enjoy the talk. So.
I don't mind giving it to you. You know what? I think that's great. <laughs>